a previous meeting. Any comments, additions? Chairman, I make a motion that the minutes be as approved as presented. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any comments? And uh, all those in favor, show by approving them, show by raising right hand. Minutes are approved. Um, before I get into the correspondence, uh, and it pleases me, and it's my pleasure this evening to make a presentation on behalf of the town council to a gentleman who is on our planning board, has served many years, not only uh, on the planning board, but he does an awful lot of things for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And on behalf of the planning board members and Maureen O'Mara and the town council, I'd like to present Peter Carter. We have in front of us uh, quite a bit of correspondence. That's why we kind of delayed a few minutes here, trying to get everybody up to speed. Yeah. We have a letter, um, a memorandum, I guess, from the code enforcement officer regarding the Inn by the Sea. We have a letter from acting town attorney regarding Blueberry Ridge subdivision. A letter from R. Anderson regarding Good Table. A letter from L. Wakefield regarding Good Table. We have a letter from Fred Sprague regarding the Susan Gabriel project. We have a letter from Stephen Parkhurst regarding the Gabriel project. Uh, we have a letter here from Shannon and Greg Haskell, I believe, regarding that project. Um, we have a letter from Stephen Moore uh, regarding uh, calculations for the Inn by the Sea parking. Um, we have a letter from Michael Hill regarding the Hanson project. And we have a memo from the Conservation Commission Chair regarding the Haskell project. Our first order of business this evening is the Gabriel Project. Uh, it's a private access way permit request by Susan Gabriel for a new lot located off Cross Hill Road. Would you want to go ahead? My name is uh, John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, and we represent Suzanne Gabriel. For the uh, application of a uh, private access way permit. The property is located uh, between Wells Road, located here, and Cross Hill Road, located on the other end of the property. Uh, the property consists of 12 or 14.7 acres, um, and it's located in the residential B zone di district. Um, Suzanne resides at her residence in the southwesterly portion of the property. Uh, the abutters to the west would be Sperling Rod Gun Club and land owned by the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, to the north and east is the Cross Hill subdivision, and to the south is um, Wells Road. The property has frontage on both Wells Road and Cross Hill. Road. The proposal consists of uh, the creation of one lot located here and a private access way within a 50 foot right of way. Uh, we have the plan has been designed in a, in a very orderly fashion, in as much as that the, uh, the lot configuration the location of the private access way and all of the utility design has been um, looked at to accommodate future development uh, if and when that, that should occur. 
We have uh, designed the access way to meet the private road standards of the town of Cape Elizabeth, uh, and we have addressed all of the technical issues um, from town staff. Uh, there were only uh, four minor changes since the last time you saw the plan, uh, and that would be the road grade. We've uh, incorporated a, a road profile on the plan to clarify the 3% grade for the first 50 feet. Uh, we have incorporated a road crown to meet the town standards. We've uh, shown a 12-inch culvert under the, the new access way, and we've added a note to the drawing uh, with regard to the Portland Water District inspection. So, uh, again, we've addressed all of, the, all of the comments, we believe, and uh, uh, we would appreciate the board to uh, act on this. Um, tonight so that we could start the construction uh, of the private access way this season. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, uh, we've scheduled a hearing regarding this project, and I'll open the hearing at this time. If there are anybody here in the audience that would like to speak, you're welcome to take the podium. If you would introduce yourself, and your address, and name and address, please. Yeah, my name is Fred Sprague, and obviously I live very close to this, uh, this proposal and live at 33 Cross Hill Road. Um, as it shows here, my property is, uh, let's see, it's right, uh, it's right here compared to where this road is going to be. And I guess uh, one of the concerns I have here is that moved to this area and bought a uh, house in the subdivision. Um, and I was looking for a place that, uh, you know, had some character, uh, obviously had some uh, worth, and uh, would maintain its value, obviously. And now I find that we're going to uh, talk about adding to, or at least accessing some property um, right near where I live. And I'm a little concerned about what's going to happen to that property. So far, we've only proposed, I guess, one lot. Um, with the size of the water main, it seems like uh, it's possible that uh, several other lots could be um, carved out of this property. And I guess I'm a little concerned about what's going to go up in that property and what it's going to look like. Um, it seems to me that Cross Hill, when they did their subdivision, had to present a plan to the town. Uh, that was accepted, and I wonder why there's no plan for this if it's going to be a subdivision. My name is Wayne Bonoff. I uh, have purchased lot 47 in Cross Hill, which is. Uh, almost directly abutting the proposed area. I have not proceeded to build a house on it yet, but I have reservations about this after hearing about what is going on, echoing uh, Mr. Sprague's concerns that the reason why we bought this lot in the neighborhood was uh, for the character of the neighborhood and the relative privacy you get there. But uh, my concerns are one house goes in now, what's to stop for the rest of it being developed? Um, finding that where we live now in Scarborough, the same thing is happening. That's one of the reasons why we bought the lot in Cape Elizabeth. So it just concerns me that uh, if this is approved, uh, what's to stop, you know, six, eight, ten houses coming in right behind? And I just wanted to voice my concern that uh, we, we have reservations now about even keeping the lot, maybe selling it and going elsewhere if, if something like this is going to happen right, <coughs> right behind our lot. Uh, my name is Barry Hansen. I am a resident of, and as of tomorrow will be an owner on uh, one tiger lily, which is not directly abutting, um, but uh, again, I share Mr. Spray and Mr. Bonoff's concerns around this um, proposal. 
being that it is uh, for a single lot and yet all of this uh, construction is being done for future needs without any proposal at the moment what those future needs might be. I know, again, as a purchaser in that neighborhood, um, understanding the covenants that are there and the standards that are um, proposed for that are actually in place for that neighborhood and whether those same uh, standards would be done for any new development um, is also my concern as well, adding to that traffic coming through there. Uh, if it is for a single lot, I guess I'm concerned about having a water main as big as it is and a road constructed to private road standards here and not just as, as a driveway. Um, those are my concerns. My name is Daniel Flaherty, and I live at 305 Commercial Street in Portland. I own lot 44, which is directly across from the proposed road, which would be right, right here, I believe. Uh, we did submit a letter this morning to Ms. O'Meara. I'm not sure whether or not she received that, but I just wanted to make note that we did, did submit one. Um, I share the same concerns as the other people that spoke tonight. Uh, we are concerned that this one road will eventually lead to future development. Uh, that's how it's being designed. Um, and, and with the size of the water main and, and the size of the road, it, it's clearly going to be a future development looking at the size of the lot. I have an additional concern that I have two small children, and the road is going to be directly across from our house and our driveway. And we're very concerned about the additional traffic coming in if, for future development, traffic coming in and out of that road kids playing in the yard, kids playing you know, in the driveway, so um, we have a, a great concern about that. We also, if you also look at the shape of the road, the curves right here, um, so we're just concerned too about, you know, the visibilities with cars coming in and out, coming around that turn with, with the trees and all, that, that all that has been considered, and uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron Mosier, and I live at, uh, we're actually building a house on lot 10 at Cross Hill, which is on Cross Hill Road, right at the, uh, right up the hill, on right here. Um, basically, it seems like we're being set up almost for a larger subdivision at some point. I mean, right now, yeah, they want to turn it into one single family lot, and that's great, but the size of the water main and the size of the road really does seem to indicate they want to subdivide it at some point. And my feeling is that when we have a subdivision in there that's 8, 10, 12 houses, kind of tagging on to Cross Hill. Cross Hill, a lot of thought was put into the covenants, a lot of thought was put into the, into the design and engineering, the planning, that this lot, this subdivision, if it does exist at some point, will be able to kind of piggyback on that, not conform to our, to our covenants. House design can be whatever they want, impacting our values, another supply of lots comes on, they can kind of build that as Cross Hill, and I don't feel that's quite right. Um, I'd like to see them, see if they could actually, I don't fault anyone for wanting to build their land, but if they could put an entrance on Wells Road, My name is Steve Parkhurst. I am the uh, developer of Cross Hill uh, Subdivision. And the one thing that troubles me is that we're getting a 50-foot right-of-way, obviously with a water line that is intended to supply more than one house. And <clears throat> it seems to me from my 10 years on the planning board in the past that we have asked for a master plan or a piece of land <coughs> um, that is obviously going to have future development on it. And the other issue is, <coughs> um, if I'm not mistaken, they do not have the sight distance uh, heading towards Wells Road that would enable them to have a legal subdivision under our current zoning ordinances.
Hearing no more presenters, I will call this hearing to a close. At this time, uh, are there any items that you would like to discuss on this project? Just um, a question about uh, traffic sight lines from the ordinance. Uh, rather than dig into it here, I was just wondering if you might know off the top of your heads, are sight lines not required for a single lot public access waiver, but are required for subdivisions? Adequate sight distances is, is required for both private access ways and for subdivisions. And it is my understanding that this particular project meets the site distance requirements for a private access way. But I'm going to defer to John Mitchell in case he wants to add to that. Yeah. We, we have measured uh, site distances in both directions, and they're labeled on the plan. Um, note number six on sheet two. We measured a site distance of 252 feet to the north in this direction and a distance of 200 feet to the south in this direction. I believe those, those distances were reviewed by the town engineer and found to be adequate. Mr. Chairman, if I may make an observation, uh, it seems that the applicant was encouraged to provide for potential future development by establishing the right width driveway and, and looking at site distances and, and looking at the size of a water main, uh, which probably makes sense if there's the possibility for legal and, and uh, allowable development later on. And it seems like the the residents in the area are concerned that this is a, you know, a, a behind the scenes, behind the curtain attempt to get a subdivision going without going through subdivision approval. Uh, I can certainly assure you that if, if such an application came before the board when I was a member, I would expect any future development to meet all of the ordinance requirements for a subdivision. But maybe it would be helpful if, if the applicant could comment a little bit on future plans for the rest of the property, if there are any at this time. Uh. If, if the board remembers, we have, uh, in every time that we've met with you, from the workshop to the completeness, uh, I believe there have been three times that we've met with you now, uh, we have continuously stated that um, if Suzanne wants to, it's, I mean, she, she has no current intentions to develop this property into a subdivision uh, currently, but she does want to reserve her rights as a landowner to develop uh, or sell future land uh, if the need arises. If it's not her, maybe it's her children. With that in mind, we have designed this uh, to accommodate future development. Um, it, that, that is the logical way to plan um, uh, a project like this. Um, this road has been designed to meet the frontage requirements, the 125-foot minimum frontage requirements for a single lot. If Suzanne wants to develop another lot, this road would, uh, would continue in this direction here, and another lot would be conveyed. Uh, again, she has no current plans to develop this property. Uh, Say anything in addition to that, Sue? I mean, you you have stated that publicly, and I don't know what more to say. Um, we're not trying to uh, pull the wool over the town's eyes or uh, 
back the town into a corner as as claimed in this uh, in this letter that you received. Uh, this is a, as I said once again, it's an orderly way to plan uh, a project like this. Just just to continue what John said, when Ms. Gabriel first came to me and told me that she was thinking of maybe doing something somewhere on her property, I encouraged her to hire some professional assistance because she said maybe one lot, but I don't want to, you know, maybe something else later on. And I was very concerned that she would design the first lot in such a way that it would make it difficult to access the rest of the land in the future and we'd be presented with some situations that we've had to deal with in the past. So I encouraged her to look at the long-term um, use of her property and she, she's made it clear that she has no plans, but that doesn't mean that she couldn't come in next month and propose uh, an additional lot, which would trigger subdivision review. Well, I, I guess I, I would just say, and, and in response to the comments from from the abutters, that um, I think it's only fair as a board that we review the application that's before us and not try to review an application based on uh, what might happen down the road uh, and an application that is not yet before us. So. While I appreciate the concerns that perhaps uh, there may be a later subdivision application, um, that's not that's not what we're that's not what we're looking at tonight. And I don't think it would be fair to color our decision tonight based on something that that hasn't yet happened and uh, and isn't before us. So, uh, if and when there's a subdivision application, obviously we we would look at that uh, based on its merits, but. That's not what's before us now. Mr. Chair, I, I uh, with along those same lines, the reason I asked the earlier question to verify the sight lines uh, was because it would be uh, unfortunate for a subdivision to come down the road, down at some point in the future, uh, asking for less than adequate sight lines. Uh, under the ordinance, uh, but given the fact that the ordinance requires 150 to 200 feet of sight line for a subdivision, and you've got 200 in one direction and 252 in the other, um, that then, uh, if, if that wasn't there, I would uh, see reason to look at this uh, in a different light. Um, and in terms of the uh, amount of traffic on the road, uh, what we're looking at in our application here is uh, one house lot compared to a 100 lot subdivision. And even in the future, if it's eight lots compared to a 100 lot subdivision, I'm not sure that's equally not something that would really be. Uh, and, and just to clarify concerned. that, um, it, this. You can't get eight lots in this on this piece of land here. The two lot, uh, a two acre minimum lot size, uh, deducting roads and unbuildable land. You you simply can't get eight lots. Uh, and I have a final question that uh, really hasn't been raised yet, probably because it's so basic, uh, but seems to be something that uh, uh, might be relevant. Uh, is is Cross Hill Road an accepted town of Cape Elizabeth Street at this point in time and no longer just part of the subdivision? Yes, I, I believe the council has accepted it, hasn't they? Haven't they, Steve? It's just out of curiosity, how many lots do you think could fit within the uh, the new lot that's being created there? Well, the total site acreage is 14.7 acres. Uh, subtract the 2.4 from the slot that we're proposing. Um, you have to subtract at least two acres for a Suzanne's residence. Uh, subtract the um, the area for roads. Subtract unbuildable land. There are some wetlands on this property. Um, you may be able to get four. Thank you. 
Uh, I'd like to add just one thing, uh, just to convey to the, uh, the residents uh, that have spoken. This road is being designed to town standards, uh, equal to uh, Cross Hill. It's 25 feet wide, it's crowned, has proper drainage, um, curbing. I'd also like to comment on that. I think that uh, it's been said earlier that we spent a lot of time to make sure that this was up to the town standards and to put some of you newer residents at ease. Our standards are pretty, uh, pretty deliberate and require, um, require certain things that will make your property probably uh, a little more valuable, but one of the things that we do, for instance, is that we require a private access way to be paved for the first 50 feet. So when you drive by that road, uh, um, you, you don't see it as a dirt road. So I just thought I'd make a couple other comments, John. I just thought of one other thing. The, the reason for the 8-inch water main, it's not a 6-inch, it's a 8-inch that we're proposing is that if a second lot is, is ever developed, um, more than likely we're going to have to have a fire hydrant and an eight inch is required for a fire hydrant. So that, that's the reason, that's the main reason for the eight inch. Any other questions? I have a motion that let's just further discuss. Go, go to it. Uh, motion for the board to consider findings of, <laughs> excuse me, findings of fact. One, Suzanne Gabriel is requesting a private access way permit for a new lot located off Cross Hill Road, or 5-40-1, which requires planning board review under section 19-7-9, private access way standards. Two, the application was deemed complete on September 18, 2001, and a public hearing was held on October 16, 2001, Three, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access way standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Suzanne Gabriel for a private access way permit for a new lot located off the Cross Hill Road be approved. A motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Is there any discussion? There's no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please uh, show by raising your right hand. The motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chair, since I recused myself from the earlier presentation of this application, I would like to do so again at this point in time. It's all right with me. I don't see any other. Second order of business this evening is the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bower Beach Road is uh, requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to allow functions with up to 144 people to be held at the Inn. Current site plan approval includes a 43 guest room <laughs> hotel with some small function rooms and a 48 seat restaurant. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Um, Stephen Moore from Moore and Sheridan Landscape Architects. Here this evening, <coughs> excuse me, on behalf of the Inn by the Sea, for the site plan amendment that the chair has just mentioned. With me this evening are Maureen McQuaid, the innkeeper in honor of the Inn by the Sea, and Susan Legg, who um, manages and owns the dining room and the function operations. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is talk about the additional items that the board raised at the last meeting, talk about what was addressed in our proposal, focusing on first the site plan and the parking issues, and then talking about the noise issues. So with 
status or the format. Um, at the last meeting, what the board had asked for clarification and um, further refinement on the part of the applicant um, were really three or four areas. The first one was parking. The second one was noise. The third one was associated planting and site plan improvements um, around the parking issue. And then additional follow-up on um, noise issues, specifically around barriers and controls. Um, with that as background, what I'd like to do is just talk about the site plans that were submitted to you in September. On my left is the overall site plan that has been modified from the previous application um, in two ways. First, the overflow parking that was behind the innkeeper's house has been removed. In talking with the neighbors to the north, that they objected to the parking located in that area. They did not object to the small strip of land that's immediately adjacent to the parking lot um, being used as overflow. It's land that is owned and controlled by the inn, but obviously it's adjacent to that property. And the inn was interested in making sure that whatever was done for overflow parking would meet with um, any neighbor's concerns. So we've shifted that and adjusted the parking so that there are nine overflow spaces um, down on that northern side of that parking lot. In association with that change, uh, we've also added some additional planting in that area, primarily for uh, screening, not only of the parking events, but also because that is the snow storage shelf for the inn. And uh, if you saw it this past winter, that snow storage was up almost 89 feet. So the second plan, this enlargement of that area on that side, shows the buffer plantings, the Nevis's house is here, so the innkeeper's house is to the top. This is the parking lot in here. This area is a paved lot, and will remain a paved lot, and what we're asking the board to consider is the ability of the inn to use that strictly as overflow parking should we find that the on-site parking isn't sufficient to meet the needs um, of the inn's functions. We are not including that in any of the calculations. We're not asking for the board to consider that for tabulation. We're simply saying there are nine spaces that are available on that lawn. And as part of the amendment, we're asking for um, the ability to use that as overflow parking. The other piece that we're talking about is the addition of planting down that barrier. Right now, there are several white pines, some Rosa rugosa, and a small assortment of shrubs here, and then a white pine that was planted here um, for the neighbors in memory of their daughter's wedding. What we've added to this, and we're proposing to change on this, is that we want to add some evergreens to complement the evergreens that exist on the neighbor's land. So we're using uh, Austrian pines, a rosa rugosa and bayberry bed, and then some summer sweet clethra. Again, all we're trying to do is put in plants that gives us uh, at a shrub height three to four feet of a barrier and then the trees obviously up at that seven to eight foot height. And that's a reflection not only of the concerns we heard from the board, uh, but also the end wanting to get the planting in and buffered on that edge. Regardless of this even being used for that overflow, the desire is to get that buffer reinforced. The one thing that the neighbors have asked is that we not plant tall growth right in here because that's their view quarter out and over the croquet lawn and down to um, Ram Island. So we're not proposing high plants in here specifically at that neighbor's request. Um, it seems counterintuitive because the parking is here and you can see it, but we're leaving the white pines and keeping shrubs that'll get up around um, five or six feet in so we've made those modifications in the plan, included the plant list in there, and are showing that um, strictly as grass uh, overflow parking. Again, trying to adjust not only to what we heard from the board about uh, the skepticism of our parking tabulation, but also because we're trying to respond to the neighbors about uh, the concerns about parking in that area. When we submitted our tabulation in our September 27th submission to you. We had run through a parking calculation 
and sent that into the town. Maureen and I had subsequent conversations about that parking tabulation, uh, which generated the letter that came to you uh, in the correspondence package. And what I'd like to do is just walk you through that parking tabulation. Um, as we understand it, and I think this is consistent with what Maureen has spelled out, there are 104 paved legal parking spaces on the site. In other words, spaces that meet uh, specifications of your ordinance for parking. We know that on the parking count, we have 43 units, so we have to deduct the 43 units from the 104 that arises at, puts us at 61 spaces. We have 13 employee spaces that we've gone through in terms of the ordinance, knowing we have to pull those out, which leaves us 48 spaces. Um, Maureen, in her memo, indicated the need to include um, the calculation for the two function employees, which drops us down to 46. And then when we deduct the two spaces that the innkeeper's house has to have because it's a residence, even though it's on the grounds, it's required to have those spaces, we arrive at 44 spaces. That 44 spaces is really a, an aggregate of the 12 spaces that the restaurant has and uses when it's open to the public, the seven function room spaces. Um, again, in our tabulation, we've indicated that the function rooms require 12 or 13 spaces. Maureen indicated that they actually required seven spaces, so we adjusted our calculation to reflect, um, maybe I should say the code's office is there, uh, in terms of the parking calculation, which, are, which left us with that 25 so-called uncommitted spaces, in other words, 25 spaces that are not specifically called for in your ordinance. In our earlier discussions and presentations to the board, we have talked about the parking counts and wanting to have um, the guest numbers reflect as much as the inn could actually fit on the lot rather than trying a number of guests and then make them somehow park somewhere. What we've done to that end is we're asking the board to consider that we want to use those 44 spaces. In other words, take the subtraction of the units, the function guest, and the innkeeper, and we know those are fixed. And we know those have to be taken off the 104 um, counted, which leaves us with the 44 spaces. The thinking being that the 25 spaces um, that are so-called uncommitted, the seven function room spaces and the restaurant spaces could all be devoted to whatever those functions are at the end at any given time. Whether it's the dining room is open, the function rooms are working, or nothing's out, nothing's in the inn or in the restaurant, but rather just on the outside uh, uses going on. What we arrive at is that number of 176 that's supported by the 44 real spaces that are there. Because again, we're using the ordinance standards at um, four people per vehicle. So four per vehicle times 44 spaces pushes us to that 176 number. The comfort level that we're trying to factor back in, both for the inn's operation and for the board, are those additional nine spaces that we're not counting as part of the tabulation to arrive at a number count. In other words, we're saying that there are nine spaces out there, in addition to the 44, that can absorb some of the vagaries um, that the board feels might happen as a result of different levels and different numbers of people arriving at the function. Um, we've actually witnessed um, six people arriving in vehicles, as well as uh, a number of cars with four. So we're comfortable, again, bringing that forward. But finishing this up, being responsive to the board, what we're saying is that there's 44 paid spaces that are there and will be used for the function guests but there's an additional nine spaces in that overflow area should the board grant the use of that so that we actually have 53 spaces that are available um, or about a 20 or 24% buffer in that parking requirement um, should this move forward at that level of 44 spaces supporting the 176 guests. Um, and again, I think that's consistent with what was in Maureen's tabulation in terms of uh, the deduct and what we're asking the 
board to consider is the fact that when that when the functions are going, the kitchen is pretty much fully involved with supporting the functions. So from Susan Maureen's standpoint, with the kitchen committed to serving the function guests, they're not going to open to the public. That, that restaurant's just simply not going to be open to the public when those functions are, are going at those levels of 125 or 130 people. When there's a meeting there, when there's a small function, when a group of 30 or 40 um, comes out and is out of the function on that outside, then in fact, yes, that restaurant um, can stay open because the lines in the kitchen aren't required to support smaller functions, um, be they in the seal coat room or uh, outside. So again, we've adopted that and brought that forward to you, both in the hopes that um, it'll put at rest some of your concerns about the parking tabulations and parking counts, um, but also to prove that we can support that number of guests based both on your ordinance, but also from a practical standpoint. We set aside all the issues of shared parking and overlap and proving vacancies and no vacancies and are simply going forward on the face of it in terms of parking spaces and number of people. Last issue to talk about is the issue of noise. Uh, we submitted to you the chart that we've been tracking that shows in the sound level tables what's been recorded at the various locations around the property in terms of um, sound pressure and uh, those levels. And the two that have been looked at on the property line are A and B. B being right adjacent to that side long tent area, A being up by the Nevis' house, C being out in front of the units, just about um, 20 or 25 feet up from that property line with um, the Crescent Beach State Park, and then out in the parking lot, and then lastly D out in the front on the other side of the building. And what we've shown you is a somewhat hour by hour tabulation and then readings that both um, acoustic treatments did through their instrument and then the inn has been doing through their instrument that again, we calibrated them both to make sure that they were reading equally on the site. And one thing that happened last month when I <laughs> met with the board and talked about what would be done at that event um, the week after, I think, our meeting, um, we had talked to a supplier who was gonna get blankets here to put up hang in that space to have the, not just the tent flaps, but the actual acoustic barrier and absorption blankets up. Those blankets got shipped to another place. They didn't get shipped up here. They weren't available. So if you went out there and were looking for blankets, there weren't acoustic blankets there. I apologize for that. That happened out of our control in terms of both the inn um, and our office. What did happen was the flaps went down, and Tom did his additional readings there with the flaps down. As a result of his readings and his follow-up, he came out with the recommendations and information that was included in the package that came to you on September 27th. And essentially what Tom has said in terms of that uh, sound pressure is that there are really three standards that have to be met with the inn's operation in order to meet the standards that the town has for um, noise levels at the property line. And what he put forward are spelled out specifically in his report. I've incorporated them into the site plan that came before you. But essentially what Tom McLennan is saying is that uh, 10 flaps alone aren't enough to drop that acoustic level down. There has to be the incorporation of an acoustic uh, blanket that has a rating, a noise rating, an NRC rating of at least 0 0.85. And all that is is an industry standard measurable standard that is applied to um, different materials and fabrics that rates that ability to absorb or break up um, the sound pressure waves. So what Tom has said is um, three things. First of all, he stated that in both tent locations there are specific decibel levels that cannot be exceeded 30 feet away from the noise source. And again, what we did in those submissions is we indicated um, 
the sound sources in each, uh, each tent location. But what Tom has said is that in the front lawn, 30 feet away from that noise source, the maximum level can be 80 dBA. In the side lawn, in his recommendation, he said it can be 70 dBA. In addition, Thomas said, at both locations, there have to be the acoustic blankets down on two sides of the tent. And that's that little attachment that came to you um, this evening. And again, I thought a graphic would help on my, on your left, is that shaded area of the tent. And again, the tents are 30 by 70 or 40 by 70. And what Tom is saying in both instances is that those flaps have to be down and that acoustic blanket has to go in place. And the way that acoustic blanket is designed is they're made similar to um, what is in your package information in that uh, 48 to 54 inches wide grommets at the top. We've been working with the tent suppliers make sure that we have fittings that fit that blanket onto the hooks that run on the rail on the top um, so that we know, in fact, these can work with the tents that uh, the inn brings out for the events. And what Tom has said is you really need to have those blankets in place on those two sides with that coefficient that he's talked about in terms of NRC coefficient of um, 0 0.85. What we've done is we've incorporated that recommendation onto our site plan, but Again, we took it a step further. Um, we sensed very clearly from the board that there was some concern about the side lawn events. And so accordingly, we've taken Tom's recommendation where he said 70 dBA is the maximum in the side, and we've dropped that down to 60 dBA at 30 feet from the noise source in the side tent. The reason we did that is twofold. First, we needed the standard that we can work with Susan and Maureen so they can go out and read it and then they can keep it registered. It's much easier to actually read this right in the tent than it is to go wandering up and down the property line and go stand next to the birdhouse and get that pointed right way. Uh, we felt one of the clearest and easiest things to deal with was to have those readings right in front of the music. So we dropped that 10 dB below what the acoustic treatments our recommendation was for the side tent, and again, it was twofold. First, the measurable standard for um, the inn, but secondly, so that the board understood what the inn's trying to do in terms of work and meet that ordinance. And again, to go back to the ordinance, the way the ordinance reads, this is a 60 dB reading here and then a 55 dB here. What the inn has been working towards is to just measure 55 dB at all points. That's what the inn is looking at as a clear standard that they want to meet. Um, so it's your ordinance and then a little lower on the two areas where your ordinance allows is that to rise up. And again, the reason for going to 60 on the site plan that would move forward um, as a part of this is just to get that factually on the record and so the board understands and the neighborhood understands that the inn is serious about monitoring this doing everything they can to keep that noise level down. Um, we submitted the technical information for the blankets and the blanket suppliers um, in the package that came in to you. Um, Tom has been working with our office on some of the design issues. I think the other thing that we need to impart to the board is we believe that with that system that we've spelled out in the submission, in other words, with the blankets that have the Velcro flap and the closures that actually extend up Underneath the flaps, the flaps on the tent hang down about eight or nine inches below the top of that blanket because, again, noise will break and carry out any little seam. Um, the feeling of that is we know we have a starting point with these blankets at that rating, and we know we can accomplish that based on what um, Tom McLennan has indicated has to happen. But for the inn and for us, the operation is simply we have to be at 55 dB at that property line. So we have a recommendation. We would follow through with getting those blankets installed. But clearly, if the three and a half inch blanket doesn't meet the 55 dB, the end's going to come back in and do additional muffling 
or whatever is needed to add to those blankets to accomplish that 55 dB. And I think that's, that's the standard that the inn is really looking at and saying, we will meet that. We know we can meet that um, design. Acoustic treatments has said you can meet it with this kind of treatment, but there's additional technology to build that out should what Tom is saying not actually be able to meet that on that first try through. So the inn is going to keep monitoring that, install those blankets, and move forward based on these recommendations uh, that you see in Tom's uh, report that's before the board. But uh, Tom was vehement that we could in fact meet that, uh, looking at a 5 to 7 um, dBA drop from the use of those blankets. And that's why we wanted to get those standards onto the site plan um, so that in the future, the codes officer and the town have something to go back to and know they can measure at the source. Um, one thing I failed to mention is that Tom's recommendation was also no amplified music in that side yard. That's on the site plan and in the package as well. Um, again, the thinking is that you're coming out and you're a bride or a function person and you're booking with the end want to have a uh, six or seven piece uh, band with a DJ that's amplified throughout here. If you want to be in the side yard, then your selection of music has to be acoustic, not amplified. And again, the thought is that we can develop the standards in place. Um, uh, last thing to wrap up, in terms of additional information on the board, concerns about, we submitted in our information to you the other issues around um, hours of operation and timing and function sizes and guests on the property. And again, the operation times are proposed as 11 to 9, I'm again restricting it, and we're proposing that um, at any given time period in the year that those outdoor functions, in that year time frame, that those functions be limited uh, in terms of quantity, which again is spelled out in our um, submission to you. And you can tell I'm stalling, I don't remember what that number is. <laughs> Help me. Help me before I blush. <laughs> no one's helping me. We had a quantity of events, maximum number of events. 60 days. Thanks for your help. <clears throat> um, 24 events. I apologize. It's not 24 events. Second page, third paragraph in your, in your letter. But again, there was a concern from the board <clears throat> about um, taking up every weekend, taking up every available weekend slot, and we tried to get a measurable standard in there for the board to follow up on in terms of staff being able to check on, on what's happening um, at the end. With that, um, I think Maureen wanted to address the board briefly, just about where the inn is. Maureen McQuaid wanted to address the board briefly um, about where the inn is, and she doesn't speak in public. And so she's nervous. I totally can't believe. This is where I asked Dale Town to get my money back. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to speak and for being a business in Cape Elizabeth. I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that I'm here and I'm a neighbor. I'm part of the community. I live there. It's important to me to do what it takes to be a good neighbor so that Maureen believes in what we do. I think Mike McGovern and Bruce, I don't want to have to have any problems with them. So we've gone through a whole lot of papers, but to me, it's real simple. It's 44, 44 parking spaces and 55 dBi. I mean, that's all I have to think about, through all these stats and all these things that we've gone back and forth. That I understand. That I know I can control. That I can say to Maureen, it will happen. And that's the way I like to do business. I guess that's, and I, I thank you for being a part. I mean, I, I want you to think when you have a wedding, you come to the end, we're going to do a good job. Uh, one of the brides is, uh, that's coming up this summer, she used to work at the front desk. She's a Cape Elizabeth resident, and this is where, and she lives out of state. She's coming back to have her wedding with us. 
that's the kind of thing that, that uh, we want to do within the community, and it's important. It's important to us going forward. It's also important that we do something because we do have people that have weddings planned that need to know what to do. We need to know. Uh, we've stopped all booking. We need to know what to do. We're kind of in limbo now. And I'm standing here saying that uh, I'm going to make a commitment to you, to the board, to the town, to my neighbors, that the 44 and the 55 will happen. Thank you. Um, one other thing, we just, to apprise the board of this, you may already know this. We submitted uh, information to Michael McGovern on Monday, who initiated with the town council on Monday evening um, our request for a text amendment for off site parking. <coughs> so that will be coming to you, I believe, for your comments um, in the near future. So again, a look at the issue of how we can get some cushion for parking with um, an association with St. Bart's or one of the other nearby um, existing parking lots. So that that is in the works as well to uh, be able to allow the in the business B zones to take advantage of existing parking lots and a shared use uh, parking. So that is out there, but it's not before the board this evening or part of the uh, discussion, uh, nor is it really germane except for you to know that. So with that, Back to the chair. Thank you. Mr. Charles. Thank you. Uh, certainly do appreciate the amount of proactive effort that the Inn is putting forth in, in getting this resolved. That's, that's commendable. Uh, we too have to try and understand and follow the rules of, of the zoning ordinance and understand what your submission is. Unfortunately, we're once again reviewing some materials that just came tonight. So I uh, haven't had a lot of time to look through it. And so if you'll bear with me, Mr. Moore, I'd like to ask a couple of questions to make sure I understand. Um, you commented a moment ago about 24 functions per year. And the submission that I have, which is dated September 27th, says um, outdoor function timing and frequency would be 60 days, 30 of which would be on the weekends. Am I on the right correct. track? That's the correct. OK. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what the numbers were. That's correct. Uh, also, the, the submission I have talks about uh, 144 guests tonight. You're talking about 176. Correct. That's a result of the change in the tabulation that happened okay. when Maureen called and we talked through the, okay. the parking count. So we've made an adjustment based on the parking tabulation that we got from. So if, if I understand correctly, uh, for those functions where the seal cove room and the library uh, would put you over the limit, those, those, the parking that goes at the restaurant, the library, and the seal cove room add up to 76 folks, if I'm out calculating this right. And you're talking about 176 folks. So that means any time there's an outdoor function greater than 100, the seal cove room and the library and the restaurant have to all be shut down. Is that what you're proposing or committing exactly. to? Okay, because uh, it's sounding like we're going to have to have some terminology and any, any ultimately approved plan that addresses those kinds of splits between different functions at the end, just to make sure that, that everybody's happy that we've accommodated you know, what you've committed to and what the, what the ordinance says. Um, on the, the noise portion of it, again, thank you for doing all the homework and, and you're doing a great job trying to explain DBA and SPLs and all that to us. If I understand that part correctly, you're committing to maintaining a noise level that you cannot today demonstrate because functions are done for the year. So again, there would have to be some wording in any ultimately approved site plan that establishes a performance standard, and then there would have to be some demonstration of that next year. When the functions start up again, there would have to be testing done. Is that what you're thinking? How, would you, how do you plan to demonstrate to the board that, that the, the spec has been met, I guess? We have absolutely no issue with following through on that. We think that has to happen. That was the intent. When we tried to get the blank, right. of course, we could demonstrate that. And <clears throat> excuse me, our feeling about that is um, Tom will go through. He is working on ordering and, and getting those designs for those blankets completed. Those will go in, and we feel we have to do at a minimum one follow-up testing with Tom 
so that he can certify, because he's got to go out anyway and check for that initial installation, make sure the blankets are up and properly installed, train staff in how the blanket installation has to go. Um, so he'll be there, and our thinking was we'd take a reading then, because we need to test that anyway to make sure that it really works. So we knew we have to at least follow up with that one reading from Tom, because it's his design and he right. needs to um, follow up and give his seal approval that it was properly installed and that um, it actually meets the standard. But what you're hearing from the end is whether it takes blankets all around it, that, that standard of 55 will be met. That's, but our, our only way to see clear that is we've got to follow up with a round of testing just You've to make sure that we prove it to it. yourselves as well as anyone else Correct. is looking. Yes. Uh, and thank you for that. Are there any issues with either safety for egress from tents or heat with big insulated blankets on a tent in the summer that well, need to be addressed? Again, the, because we're only um, using the flaps on the two sides. On two sides. We're not, we're not terribly concerned about cross ventilation. They stand back a little bit on the two corners, um, mostly for some acoustic subtleties that I don't completely understand from Tom. But if you notice in the, in the information that's in there, it's four feet short on one length and four to six feet short on the other. Um, but the conditions in there are going to be similar to what it would be on a rainy day in summer, with okay. the flaps all the way down. Okay. Um. I think I'll, I'll hush up. I'm sure there's other members of the board who have, who have comments as well. I just add that uh, much as I can relate to the desire to get this approved and going uh, in my business, we started working on Christmas in July. Uh, personally, I have a hard time seeing how we can conclude this tonight. Uh, and I also feel that this is an issue that requires some public input, which would require us scheduling a public hearing. So while I sympathize, I think we've got a little bit more work to do from my viewpoint. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, yeah, Mr. Moore, I, in hearing the presentation on the parking, I, I guess uh, I don't have a problem with uh, creating the number of spaces based on the number of people with the outdoor functions closing the restaurant and the function rooms or having the restaurant and the function rooms open utilizing the maximum number of parking spaces those would use and then limiting the outdoor uh, functions to whatever's left of parking. If I understand it, that's part of your proposal. The problem I have is, is the in-between proposal where you seem to be asking for some type of sliding scale where, well, if only a certain number of people are using the restaurant or some of the function rooms, then it may open up other parking spaces. And, and I just don't see, and maybe Maureen can comment, how that could be enforceable. I mean, parking is usually done on using the maximum amount, either that or it's closed altogether. <clears throat> and I don't know how you can enforce something where there's a, you have to monitor the number of people less than the maximum in any given room. I, I, I understand your concern, because I was trying to work it out in my mind, too. Um, and you're right, it, it, if you just close everything, it's, it's easy. You can say, all right, 176 guests. And how you monitor it otherwise, y you wouldn't be making sure that, pe you know, that people are parking in different areas. And quite frankly, it's going to be monitored if they start parking people all over the lawn and out on Bowery Beach Road and somebody makes a complaint. Um, there, I think if the board approves this, you want to make sure that you have a very clear condition that talks about the number of people that can be on site for different things and when events are open. And the, the confusion that I had with the applicant was that they were calculating their parking for the Seal Cove room and the library based on the occupancy allowed for the, those rooms uh, under the fire code. And I understand the logic of doing it that way, but in my opinion, you ought to be using the parking standard which bases it on square footage. Now, if someone who's running the inn starts mingling those two together and says, well, you know, I have 150 and I've got 12 more people upstairs in the Seal Cove room, so that means I still have more parking. Obviously, that's not going to work. So there needs to be some, some very clear definition of if you have booked an outdoor event for more than 100 people, then these other places have to be closed. I think that's not, I think you would accept 
that condition. It's when it's when it's below 100, and then you then feel you can utilize some of the space inside, but not all of it. And that, my point is, I think that that's really the issue. Exactly, is that it's it's not that gray zone where it's 125 outside, and can we fit that additional? Do we shut the restaurant down or not? It's that there's only 30 or 40 or 60 or less than 100, whatever that number is, that are exterior. It's that ability to still have, on a Thursday afternoon, a law firm out in the uh, Audubon room and a function going on outside. The, the ordinance says that you need one space for every four guests. And if you calculate the 104 parking spaces on site and subtract out everything based on what the ordinance says you have to have for parking, they have 25 spaces that are surplus without the outdoor functions. So in theory, they ought to be able to have an outdoor function with 100 people and still be able to run the restaurant and still be able to have the Seal Cove room and the library open. Right. I, I guess just not to beat a dead horse here, but what, what I would feel more comfortable with is if any of those rooms are open, you then must apply the maximum number of parking spaces that can be used in any of those rooms against the total number of spaces at the end. Because otherwise, I think it's just impossible to try to figure out um, what, what you can use and, and what you can't use. Absolutely, I agree. The, the issue for me is the one you're touching on, which is enforceability. That, that the call will come not when there's two or three open spaces, but when the lawn is covered with cars. So it's having that standard that the staff can go back and read it and say, show us what that booking was for that day so they can see what, what was happening there. Right. And I think, I think the only way it works is if you, a room is either open for use or it isn't. If it's open for use, you have to count it as Correct. being fully used for Correct. parking purposes. Absolutely. I think it may even be simpler than that. The, uh, the library and the seal cove room are small, small spaces. They're either full or they're not with what you're suggesting. What you really can't do is have half a restaurant. Either the restaurant is utilized, in which case 12 spaces are accounted for, or it's closed, in which case 12 spaces are freed right. up. And the reality of that is what I, I said in the presentation. When Susan has a wedding going, when it starts to reach those larger numbers, that kitchen, those lines are required to support those functions. So that the practical reality is you just can't keep that restaurant open. I, I likewise appreciate all the effort you've put into the application. Um, I, I run by the Inn by the Sea all the time. My in-laws stay there every Christmas. I think it is an asset to the town. Uh, I think the other week I noticed there was a, a, a valet person out there. It looked like he was directing parking, perhaps in an effort to deal with the issue. Uh, but I am also concerned, uh, as Andy Charles has mentioned, that I think this may require a public hearing. I am curious uh, to hear from Maureen whether there has been any comment from the butters or has been. Okay. That confirms my uh, belief that we need to have a public hearing on the, the application. I'd like to echo everyone else's comments that have spoken um, and compliment you on your um, diligent attention to trying to address our concerns. I just have one very minor question, and that um, is to the noise. Um, you're submitting the application tonight with hours of outside events from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. I don't have my materials from the last time you came before us, but I thought I remembered an earlier end time of these events at your last submission of perhaps seven, and my memory may be very faulty. No, that's correct. In the previous submission and in our workshop, we talked about ending at seven, which is the current practice at the end. Mm -hmm. That's what the end is doing now. Given the sizes of what we're dealing with and the relative sizes in each function area, we felt we needed to expand that out to that 9 o'clock. But again, we felt that was a reasonable curfew, self-imposed curfew <coughs> in the zone. We're still under that um, the window in terms of the noise ratings mm -hmm. at that time. OK. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. I concur with my fellow board members that a public hearing is necessary in this matter. Uh, I have 
some concerns as to the operating hours till 9 o'clock. Uh, I also have an understanding of what it takes to, to run functions like this. Uh, perhaps a compromise would be to cut it back to 8 o'clock and that there be no live music after 7, perhaps, so the function can continue and live out a life of its own, as most do, into the early evening hours. Uh, at our last meeting together with the applicant, uh, we asked if we could visit the site during the last function of the year, and we were actually invited to do so. Uh, some members of the board did, and I have to say, you didn't put your best foot forward. Uh, I don't own a decibel meter, but the noise seemed to increase as the day went on, and parking was not being managed. It was very haphazard. Whereas the plan you're submitting tonight requires a great deal of uh, active management, uh, I would be uncomfortable with this proposal unless there were a number of strict conditions with some severe boundaries as to what can and can't be done. And uh, I am, again, in support of a public hearing. I have uh, one issue that I'd like to check with Maureen on. If we're going to be dealing with this potential amendment coming up, I'd like to ask her if she'd explain the procedure so that it's on record. So that uh... um, th this uh, the Inn by the Sea is a relatively unique property in the town of Cape Elizabeth, and there has been a lot of discussion about other ways to deal with their parking needs. Uh, however, the zoning ordinance is very inflexible when you look at the in situation because it's located in a zoning district where you're not allowed to look at off-site par off parking arrangements. Further, even if it was located in a district where you were allowed to look at that, uh, their nearest off-site parking is too far away under the ordinance. So there is a, an amendment that will be before the board in your workshop in November to begin discussion that talks about changing the ordinance so that off-site parking can be considered in the BB district and can be considered up to one mile away. Um, that has nothing to do with the application before you tonight because you are uh, required to review the application based on the current ordinances. What it does do is it, it, if that amendment eventually works its way through and is adopted, uh, it does give the in the opportunity to perhaps come back to the board at some later date and amend their approval. your question. Thank you. I guess at this point uh, it appears that most of the board members here would like to have a hearing um, and I guess at this time is, are there any other comments that anybody wants to make? And, uh, can we uh, have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carter. Motion for the board to consider, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts submitted, the application of the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bower Beach Road for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to allow outdoor functions with up to 144 people be tabled to the regular November 20th, year 2001 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be scheduled. I hear a second. Is it? Is it 176 now? It is now. I would suggest you amend the motion. I'll be happy to amend the motion to 176. Second. I've had a motion made and seconded. Are there any further comments? Hearing none, then uh, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of the motion in front of us, please show by raising your right hand. Motion is carried. Third item on our agenda tonight, uh, Town Council has forwarded to the Planning Board an amendment to the zoning ordinance that would eliminate the need to annually review on-earth materials permit. 
text of the proposed amendment to section 198-5 earth materials removal standard I will read for those Earth Materials Removal Standard 19-8-5, the owner of the lot or parcel on which the removal activities is proposed to occur shall make a written application for a permit to the Planning Board in accordance with the following procedure. The Planning Board shall process an application for earth material removal activities in accordance with the procedures established for site plan review in section 19-9-4 review procedures. The planning board shall review the submitted application and accompanying materials. The planning board may require additional material that considering the probable cost and effects of the proposed activity, it deems necessary for a full consideration of the proposal and its effect including more detailed plans. The Planning Board in its review of an application may require a peer review by a professional engineer or other relevant expert. The cost of all such review, including the cost of review by the town engineer, shall be taken from the application's review escrow account. If a review escrow account has not been established pursuant to the provisions of other ordinances, governing an aspect of the applicant's proposed activity, the planning board shall be authorized to require an applicant for an earth material permit to establish a review escrow account under the terms of section 16-2-4A1 of the subdivision ordinance. Any funds not dis dispersed from the review escrow account shall be promptly returned to the applicant upon final disposition of his or her application. Within 35 days following the public hearing or such longer period as may be mutually agreeable to the planning board and the applicant, the planning board shall render its decision to approve, to approve with conditions or to disapprove in writing specifying the reasons thereof. Notwithstanding other provisions of this ordinance, the applicant or any property owner entitled to notice of public hearing who is aggrieved by a decision of the planning board under the ordinance may appeal to the superior court as provided by the main rules of civil procedure. The planning board may require the applicant furnish to the town before issuance of a permit a performance guarantee in accordance with section 16-2-4C7A of the subdivision ordinance. The amount and the conditions shall be consistent with the purpose of this ordinance and shall secure the proper performance of the alteration work. The amount shall be based upon the estimated cost of completing or correcting any work necessary to satisfy the conditions of the permit and criteria of this ordinance plus the estimated cost preventing or correcting any damage to the subject or other property which the planning board considers probable or of sufficient gravity to justify the expected expense of such guarantees. The earth material permit shall be valid for a period of one year from the date of the planning board vote prior to the expiration of the approval. The applicant may request an extension of up to one year from the planning board cause shown. The earth material permit shall remain valid in earth material removing activities have commenced prior to the expiration date. Failure to comply with the condition placed upon the earth material permit to post any necessary performance guarantees to comply with any other permitting pro processes or to address any other issues of earth material removal except pending litigation changing the earth material permit shall render the permit expired unless an extension is granted by the planning board for good cause. Uh, 
I mean, yeah. Are there any comments that the board want to make at this time regarding this change? And at this time, I will open this to a public hearing. If there is anybody in the audience that has an interest in this issue, uh, please step forward. At this time, I see nobody rushing to the podium, so we will close the hearing. Yes, Maureen. I just wanted to let the board know that Jim Murray, who is the operator of the Bluestone Quarry on Sawyer Road, uh, spoke to me today, uh, had planned to come to the public hearing tonight, but he's not feeling well. Um, and so I promised that I would forward his comments to you, which is that he wholeheartedly supports this proposed amendment. I guess we all know why. <laughs> Um, any further discussion regarding this? Mr. Chairman, may I ask for a point of clarification? Uh, paragraph 6, which is the new text in the amendment, states that the permit's valid for a period of one year after the planning board votes. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the provisions here. If extraction activities commence within that one year, then the permit is effectively valid for as long as the activities continue yes. without renewal. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought we wanted to do, which I agree with. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, hearing of no more comments, I would like to propose a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that the Earth Materials Zoning Amendment to Section 19-8-5 of the Zoning Ordinance, which would eliminate the annual permit renewal requirement, be recommended to the Town Council for consideration. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Charles seconds it. Is there any other further discussion? Hearing none, then uh, we'll put this to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, uh, please show by raising your right hand. The motion carries and <coughs> passed on to the town council. Mr. Chair, since, I, re since I recused myself from the original application of the next item on the agenda, uh, I feel it would be appropriate to do so again at this point. Neither can. I don't see no reason. <laughs> Our uh, next item on the agenda is the subdivision, uh, Old Ocean House Road subdivision amendments. Eric and Lisa Hansen are requesting amendments to the previously approved Old Ocean House Road subdivision located on Old Sea Point Road to correct surveying errors. The planning board approved amendments to the subdivision in June to create a new lot. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Doe from Sebago Technics, and I'm here on behalf of Eric Hansen uh, to uh, present uh, an amendment to the uh, previously approved subdivision, which was uh, approved by the board in June. Um, kind of a history of what had happened. Um, our survey crews went out um, to set the irons for the uh, proof subdivision, and at that time, we ran some traverse on the property and determined that the house and driveway were not where they were portrayed on the previous plan. Um, the previous plan um, was approved um, by the board back in the uh, 80 or 90, I believe it was. And at that time, um, the project was owned by uh, Rick Weinshank, and he had placed a house on the property and built a road out to it um, and then I believe he foreclosed on the loan and the bank uh, basically acquired the property back. Um, at that time in the 90s um, a lot of banks were acquiring property from developers that were basically uh, um, um, not fulfilling the requirements of the loan 
um, and the bank basically needed to unload the property at, at a inexpensive, in an inexpensive process and, and fairly quickly. So they hired our company to basically split, split the property. They provided us um, with some boundary plans, um, and I believe it was a plan that showed how the property was developed, which was the house in the driveway. Um, we proceeded with a subdivision into two lots. Um, that plan was approved by the board, um, and we kind of went away from it at that time. Eric purchased the property from the, uh, the bank, and, um, and then Elaine uh, Book, which first purchased her property. Um, Eric, at the time, uh, just this past year, decided to split the property, and then once we actually got a survey crew out there, then we determined that there was some errors in what was previously presented. Um, just to kind of go over what has happened, um, this is a plan that, is, that you have in front of you. Uh, the survey crews determined that the road actually veers off of Eric's property, goes on to Elaine's property, and then um, almost completely at some point, and then terminates with his driveway and um, uh, kind of his front lawn area actually being entirely on her property. The house, which is in yellow here, um, is actually within the 30-foot setback from the side yard. So Eric uh, met with Elaine, and um, they came to an agreement that he would purchase land from her. Uh, it's about 12,000 square feet, which is, uh, encompasses this green area. The road would stay in the same location, and we would shift the easement for that road, widen it from its original 30 to 40 foot, make it a 50 foot easement, which is more in uh, conformance with the town standards for private ways. Um, and then the balance of the previous approval we would keep those same items in its um, intent. That would be a turnaround located um, on Eric's property where his existing turnaround was. That would be expanded to meet the um, turnaround requirements for the town. The, um, kind of one of the, the advantages to this uh, kind of mishap is this um, easement, maintenance easement for the road has been rewritten to include um, all party owners, which would be these two lots and Elaine's property. Um, with that, I guess I'll, I'll open up if you have any questions um, that I can answer for you. I guess I'll, I'll uh, expose a little ignorance and ask this question. The, uh, what's the vehicle that was drafted to demonstrate agreement between the owners that the property lines could be moved? It was a memorandum of understanding. Is that the, the proper legal instrument to do that? That is, um, if, I, if I believe it right, that is to, he hasn't purchased the property, but that's kind of an, an understanding that Elaine has agreed to sell that property to to Eric. He can't purchase it until that, that property is well, actually yeah, That's why I was trying to get the... the I, think, I think what he was asking about was the indenture that basically regulates how the road will be maintained. Oh. Well, no, I was, I was getting it both because you, okay. you cleared up for me that the attor town attorney has said the indenture is, is acceptable. Um, and maybe I'm treading where we shouldn't, but I just wanted to make sure that the proper groundwork has been done on... The, the legal right to, to purchase this property so that when this is approved, uh, the transfer of, of the movement of the property lines and transfer of those 12,000 square feet has also been firmly established. Yes, and that, that's, that's one thing Eric and Elaine have been working diligently on with their attorneys and, and making that happen. Um, they can't formally make that happen until they actually get an approval from the town. Okay. Thanks.
Mr. Chairman, may I make a motion? Father. Motion for the board to consider finding of facts. Eric and Lisa Hansen are requesting amendments to the previously approved Old Ocean House Road subdivision located on Old Seal Point Road to correct surveying errors which require planning board review under section 16-2-5, amendments to a previously approved subdivision. Number two, Old Seal Point Road is a private road which needs to be maintained at a level that provides adequate access for emergency vehicles. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5, amendments to a previously approved subdivision. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Eric and Lisa Hansen for amendments to the previously approved Old Ocean House Road subdivision located on Old Seal Point Road to correct surveying errors be approved with the following condition. One, that a maintenance agreement for Old Seal Point Road be reviewed and approved by the town attorney and signed by the applicants prior to the recording of the subdivision plat. Just as a point of clarification, has the maintenance agreement already been approved by the town attorney? Uh, that letter that you have approved it, although, and I was thinking that you didn't need the condition, but we don't have it signed yet. So I would just perhaps suggest that the approval of the attorney condition be removed, that we leave in the, the, the signing. Agreed. Second motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll... Present it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, front, please show by raising their right hand. Motion carries. Thank you. Good evening. The final item on the agenda this evening is a Haskell Private Way Acts, Private Access Way Resource pr Protection Permit. Craig and Sharon Haskell are requesting a Private Access Way Permit and Resource Protection Permit to build a home and driveway on four plus acre lot off Pleasant Ave. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-7-9 private access way standards and section 19-8-3 resource protection permit. Good evening. Good evening. Us up to Jim Fisher from Northeast Civil Solutions and this evening we're here to uh, represent Mr. and Mrs. Haskell. The request has read. What I'd like to do is just very briefly go through the uh, plan that we have here to orient you as to uh, what we're looking at, and then address a few of the comments that, actually all the comments that were made by the town engineer and by Ms. Mara. What you see outlined in red is the current property uh, as owned by Mr. and Mrs. Haskell. They have off of Pleasant Avenue an access way or a, a right way area that um, uh, corresponds to a 50 foot, 52 foot wide uh, area that uh, accesses this entire property. What we propose is to have a driveway come off of this particular, in this particular area off of Pleasant View, or Pleasant Avenue, and uh, curve through this section, as you can see here in the uh, shaded area, to an approximate location of the house that you can see in this particular section right here. As outlined in your plans, and right in here, you can see that, as outlined in yellow, for those of you who can see it, uh, is the actual area of the building envelope. So you can see that relative to the overall acreage of the property, envelope in which the building could conceivably be placed is somewhat limited, uh, yet it is still sizable enough for us to be able to uh, situate that uh, proposed building there. The turnout area that you see here in conjunction with the private access way uh, is in um, uh, conjunction with uh, correspondence and conversations with the codes officer and the fire chief. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the separate material that is necessary to be able to support the safety vehicles that would be able to get into this uh, particular area, keeping in mind that it is a single driveway. And uh, because of the wetlands area and the rest of this property, RP2 zone, that which is outlined in green here, and then the uh, uh, RP1 district, which is the center section, uh, is, uh, really prohibits any potential further development of this property at all. So we're, we're only proposing uh, henceforth, now and henceforth, just a single house as you would see it. 
reason we're here also as far as the resource protection permit is concerned is that in this hatched area uh, on the plan here and that which you can see in your plans, we have to cross approximately, well, we're displacing approximately, uh, proposing to about 2,200 square feet of our feet two wetlands. We would like to be able to uh, cross the driveway in the only area that can actually get to this high ground in this section that is, again, hatched in this particular area here. That's it as far as background is concerned, unless we have any questions or comments, but I would like to be able to, uh, to address, again, some of the uh, engineer's comments, uh, some of which we've already addressed and are already completed, and then uh, a few others that uh, we do not believe applicable. Start with uh, a request for a couple of waivers, as indicated in the uh, cover letter. First one we would like is for the maintenance agreement. We have actually completed a maintenance agreement and uh, had one signed, uh, and it is in the packet, so in essence, uh, that's already done deal, as it were. However, we would like to get a waiver for that primarily because this is, again, a uh, single driveway that will only and always remain as a single driveway, given that no other house can actually be split off in this particular area. Um, the other waiver that we would like to uh, request is that which is normally required during the soil delineations for wetlands uh, for the uh, actual mapping of the soils because the uh, mapping has already been completed by Sweet Associates, a representative of which is here tonight to answer any questions that you may have. And that was based on the uh, foliage in the area. So those are the two waivers that we'd like to address. Additional information regarding the uh, stormwater flow to the uh, culvert capacity. We actually sized the two culverts. We proposed two 24-inch culverts in this particular section down here on uh, the uh, uh, westerly side of the property next to the uh, property of uh, Ramsdale's. Uh, we have currently a drainage culvert, in essence. Uh, and then a channel, a culvert that comes under uh, Pleasant Avenue, and then a channel that flows down uh, freely right now, following a channel that you can see on this plan, and then into the RP1 district, and then through that, and then off the property as it goes through the RP1 section. We size these two 24-inch culverts relative to the flow that comes out of the 30-inch culvert, and that, that is a, uh, uh, a uh, misnomer, for lack of a better term, as it's indicated in the response by the uh, community engineer, the reviewing engineer. It's not a 36-inch culvert, it's a 30-inch culvert. There's also a 15-inch culvert that is identified in this plan as well uh, that comes in just below that. That is from the uh, sheet flow of stormwater into the gutter and then into the catch basin. It already exists, and that's on uh, Pleasant Avenue. Uh, the size of those two 24-inch culverts, it's a bit overkill, but we can certainly even go up from there. Uh, I've already spoken to the reviewing engineer about this uh, relative to size of the culverts, and if it uh, pleases the board or anybody else, we can actually go to two 30-inch culverts. The potential problem in getting anything substantially larger than that is the topography of this area is relatively flat. That does not mean the section that comes off of the road here, but you can see by the preponderance of wetlands in this section that we're really only talking about a, uh, a difference in grade of approximately two feet in this entire section, which is fairly flat by the time we actually get down to the spread out of the, as you can see, the, the green section that's right down here by the hatched area. If we start getting into culverts that are uh, too much larger, we're actually going to be uh, just kind of exacerbating an existing negative situation as far as the uh, stormwater flow is concerned. So instead of putting one fairly large culvert there, we're supposed to do 24-inch, but can certainly go to two 30-inch, uh, again, if it's uh, required. We did take this information to the Director of Public Works and uh, just made sure that he was aware of the situation, asked his input, and uh, he had I'll say unofficially because we don't have anything in writing from it, but uh, he had also uh, tacitly agreed to the uh, sizes that we had suggested there. Additional properties, uh, one of Maureen's comments was uh, additional properties to, uh, should be identified on the uh, plat uh, up in this particular section and those immediately across the street. We've actually done that already. Uh, we can submit that. Wetlands based on the uh, plants in the area, and that's just a comment as far as uh, Sweet Associates having gone out there previously to take care of those wetlands. Uh, and that leads again to the, uh, the waiver for request for this actual soils mapping, given that there is a predominance of only one type of soils in the area in which we are intending to, uh, to cross right down in here. There was a comment re in the uh, uh, section from the engineer about uh, the driveway promoting flooding. Viable comment, given that uh, we're actually uh, curving across this section, uh, that is where the uh, section, meaning where the, the sheet flow actually goes into the stormwater channel, and that stormwater channel that follows the channel, as you can see it on your plan, into the RP1 zone over here. 
that is again why we proposed uh, sort of the over design of the two 24 inch culverts. So in essence, if there were no culverts there, it would certainly act as a giant dam or as a sort of dike. And uh, we're proposing to eliminate that and actually make it uh, not better than it is now, obviously, but better from the stormwater flow that's actually coming out of the existing 30 inch pipe from Pleasant Avenue uh, by going a little over the over design section. As far as the resource protection permit uh, and the comments for the reviewing engineer there, uh, he had requested or suggested that a uh, grading plan uh, would be helpful. To a certain extent, grading plans are always helpful. However, this is a driveway, and what we're proposing to do is retain the current grade between pre-development and post-development uh, to the greatest extent feasible. And what that means is we're going to follow, we're supposed to follow those contours as any driveway would, straight down to the area where we would at the point at which we would then have to raise that slightly to end up going over these culverts. Keep in mind that we can't really bury these culverts at all. They have to be, uh, the bottom of the culvert or the invert has to be at grade. If we bury them, they're going to get full of silt. So the bigger we go with the culverts, the higher we're going to end up having to go on that grade. That's not necessarily a big deal as far as creating the driveway is concerned. However, that again exacerbates a, a negative situation as far as stormwater flow off of the existing driveway, a steeper grade and flow. So <coughs> the, the number of culverts uh, still uh, over capacity for what's already there and keep them essentially at the 24 to 30 inch range, then we shouldn't have a problem for that. Uh, so I would submit that the, uh, the grading plan, as uh, indicated, is not really necessary. Again, we're talking about in this section right in here uh, because we have to be able to meet the existing grade uh, that is already in this section and the disparity of grade uh, from the high section here, as you can see on your plans, and the high section here, approximately 98 feet, 96 feet, uh, down to about the 92 foot area right in here, we're talking about four, foot, four feet of difference. The engineer did have a, uh, a recommendation that uh, he and I spoke uh, fairly about regarding a potential enclosed culvert system from Pleasant Avenue all the way down the existing drainage channel connecting to the culverts underneath the proposed driveway at this curve, and then out into the, uh, the wetland garbage zone. Uh, it is our contention, and I will certainly let Steve uh, mention it to you as well in the submission, that, uh, that is, there are other methods, let's put it that way, of, uh, of taking care of that, that that really is uh, not perhaps the, uh, the best one at all uh, for a number of reasons. One of the uh, most significant ones is that by enclosing a system there, back up here a little bit. As I understand it, uh, from some of the comments uh, that have come to uh, Maureen, is that uh, a couple of the abutters, particularly the Ramsdales, have indicated a potential ponding on their property. If we enclose the system, we are then looking at having to build up that existing channel, again, because we, have to, we can't bury a culvert. The culvert, obviously, would be uh, under the existing grade once we finish the post-development. You can't put it lower than the stormwater channel already has it, otherwise again, it fills up with silt. So we're actually building that up. Well, the sheet flow then from the, the stormwater that's actually going to be, that's existing in this section by building that up has got to go somewhere. Well, that sheet flow then can't go into the existing drainage channel, the sheet flow from uh, this section of the driveway over here. As it stands right now under our proposal, the sheet flow, minimal though it is, is going to flow into permeable surface uh, of the ground right here, which will end up then flowing into this drainage channel through the culverts and then again into the RP2 zone. If we culvert that with an enclosed system, it's going to end up coming back into this section and is actually going to uh, increase the, the negative impact, as it were. Uh, I've already explained that, or, or we've talked about that with, uh, with Steve, and uh, I, won't, I won't speak for him at this point, but uh, suffice it to say that the enclosed system is not really the best system. He also had a question about uh, the gutter flow. That's already actually been taken care of on the plan. This is the gutter flow of the uh, stormwater that's currently on Pleasant Avenue. It comes into a catch basin that is uh, located essentially right in front of uh, where our proposed access point would be. Uh, we've already addressed that by actually uh, pointing out in the plans that uh, there is, in conjunction with the 2% grade uh, in this section for the first 50 feet of paved area, that uh, the grade here actually has to come up in order to keep meaning away from the current grade of Pleasant Avenue in order to keep the sheet flow 
uh, from the actual driveway itself on that driveway and then off to the sides of it within this 52-foot area and not at all going into the, uh, the street. And that's actually addressed on that plan already. Uh, showing the existing drainage easement, Stephen mentioned that uh, uh, he would like to see or he recommends seeing the uh, easement, a drainage easement that coincides with the sewer easement, which you see right here is the sewer easement shown because we can tend to look into it. Uh, we can show the drainage easement. It's literally where the, uh, the channel is now located. We can certainly put that on the plan. Uh, he also requested or, or recommended that uh, we provide an extended easement. Uh, the current easement, as uh, the town now has it, extends to the end, approximately to the end of the Ramsdale property, not quite, but 100 feet. Uh, down from the road is approximately 102 feet. Uh, so what we would do is, uh, actually we've already done it, is to create an easement through the actually existing culvert area uh, to be able to come out into this section uh, with the flow into the RP2 zone. The reason for that easement is if something happens in the future as far as uh, the Pascals either not being able to maintain that, just not maintaining it, being sold to somebody else who doesn't maintain it or what have you, the town does have the right as far as the drainage is concerned to be able to come in and maintain that, uh, that actual uh, drainage channel. Maintain it meaning trees fall in it. Somebody's tossing grass into it or something like that. That's not actually going to have the right to be able to go in there and take care of it. Temporary wetlands at the impact uh, relative to the uh, sewer connection is uh, he has requested that we put that physical number into the resource protection permit. We can come up with an approximation, which is approximately 700 square feet of temporary impact. And temporary here is actually within one to two days. We were hesitant to do that before because the exact location of not only the, uh, the house, although it's tight, it can move back and forth here slightly, and subsequently the exact location of the connecting sewer easement hasn't been established yet. So as far as the uh, actual impact of the wetlands, we don't have a specific answer. But again, the approximate square footage based on what we have shown is uh, 700 square feet. We can put that into the report without any problem. Uh, he also had a uh, question about whether or not it might be feasible to, instead of uh, running the proposed sewer connection from essentially the middle of the house uh, directly out in this section to connect about 11 feet uh, to the uh, southwest of the existing manhole, to run it actually up in this direction so that we would avoid this uh, uh, drainage channel. The drainage channel, the con sewer connection for a single family home is relatively minor. And doing it is, uh, if a contractor is uh, actually with the salt, as it were, a contractor can do that type of connection. Remember, we're only talking about the, the drainage channel in the RP2 section in one day. Uh, at most, he starts later in one day, he may go into the next day before the connection is actually made and the backfill is completed. So that's not to say that uh, it's always going to be one to two days, but uh, typically the temporary disturbance of the RP2 zone simply for the uh, sewer connection is very limited to just a couple of days. The reason we did this is to be able to minimize the impact on the existing RP2 wetlands. If we run it outside of that drainage channel uh, and come up beyond it, then we are uh, we're affecting substantially more of the wetlands than uh, we would like to do. And again, the impact is to minimize that, uh, those wetlands, or the negative impact of those wetlands as much as possible. That's up to the board and the board's recommendations. And finally, uh, adding the invert elevations, uh, the engineer again recommended that we add the elevations. We actually have those already. That's how we ended up putting the uh, uh, sewer line into the manhole at 11 feet uh, to the southwest of its current location. Uh, and we can show that in the report. That's simply the inverts of this section here and the inverts of the kept basin back in this area. And that covers it. Any discussion regarding the completeness? Any concerns? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Fisher, you've, you've addressed a, a pretty long list of comments from the town engineer. Uh, and I see that we don't have any subsequent response from the town engineer to your facts, if you will. Uh, have you had discussions with the folks at Oast Associates? Can you give us any sense for 
their level of agreement or not with the response that you provided this evening? Sure. Uh, and I'll caveat that before I even start by saying I'm not going to speak for them, but um, I have had a couple of discussions with Steve. And uh, in essence, uh, as far as the grading plan is concerned, we're a little bit at odds there, only that he would suggest it. It's not a bad idea. It's just unnecessary as far as the driveway is concerned, from my point of view. Um, we can certainly do it, but it's not really going to show a whole lot. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, if we were to, uh, if we were actually doing some uh, construction survey work or for instance, something like that, where we are proposing an elevated structure to the point where, from a grading standpoint, we were proposing a substantial difference between uh, pre-development and post-development, that stormwater has to go somewhere, we would obviously have to show that grading plan so it doesn't affect, well, not obviously necessary, but we would, <laughs> uh, so that it doesn't affect uh, stormwater runoff onto an abutting property. In this case, because we're talking about a driveway, the minimum excavation that we're looking at is uh, stripping off the, uh, the loam top cover and replacing that with the undone materials that are already stated in this plan. In essence, when you take off the amount of loam and the required amount of MDOT materials there, you back up to grade within about three to four inches. So a grading plan, until we actually get down to this section, you're not even going to see a contour. Even if we went to a six-inch contour, you just wouldn't see it. So it really isn't necessary to dwell on that particular point. But, uh, right, and, and pardon me for interrupting. Um, I don't want to force you to go back through the entire laundry list again I, I guess I'm looking for a more of a top level assessment from your view and obviously we have to uh, await the, the final input but I'm trying to get a sense for how close are we because uh, uh, personally I'm having a hard time seeing how we get to completeness with this right. quantity of comments okay um, the only thing that uh, think about the answer is I'm trying to make this as short as possible we need, on the overall plan, uh, we need to be able to put the abutters, there's actually two abutters up here. We need to put those on the plan. We need to do that. Uh, there's a request for a couple of abutters within the uh, section right down here opposite the driveway. We can put that on the plan as well. Uh, everything else has really been completed, uh, and we will show that on the plan. In other words, we're agreeing with the, uh, the engineer in most of it. Uh, a lot of it, we believe, it is not necessary, but it's also so relatively small that it's either already done or something else to be completed. Uh, as far as overall completion of the plan, it's certainly up to the board, but uh, I would submit that uh, as you see it here, because the only substantial issues that we have are with the drainage in this particular section, that uh, we have shown, really this whole thing comes down to can we prevent ponding in this section and a backup on the Ramsdale property by putting culverts where the driveway has to occur underneath that to propagate that flow from uh, the existing drainage channel through those culverts and into the RP2 zone. And we have already done that. And the engineer just wanted to take a look at, uh, wanted us to provide, or recommended that we provide uh, some stormwater calculations. But we've already addressed that in the, uh, in the letter, the cover letter. As far as the amount of disturbance is concerned relative to this overall watershed, the stormwater modeling so small that it really can't be modeled. It's, I believe it was three one thousandths of one percent for a stormwater impact. Now that is not to confuse if it, in a hundred year storm situation, for instance, if there's a lot of water that ends up coming as there would be, it comes through the existing culvert. What would happen uh, when it comes down to this narrow channel and hits the multiple culverts underneath the road, underneath the proposed driveway? That is why we have place two of those culverts there, trying to keep them, again, relatively small so that we can minimize the impact to the wetlands by grading uh, out as, as much as we need to for safety as far as the weight of the emergency vehicles, but keeping that as constrained as possible so that we don't impact the wetlands. What he wanted or what he suggested is, uh, can he see or would it would behoove us to put in, uh, in our calculations the amount of water that flows through there? We can do that, but we've already gone overboard. What we've done, in my estimation, what we've done is take the existing capacity of the culverts that are out there and we've increased them. So the amount of water that would end up falling in this 100-foot area by not even 52 feet, we're only looking at essentially half of that because we proposed the driveway to go right down the middle, is so minimal that uh, we're really not adding anything that is modeled, that could be really conceivably be modeled from 
the stormwater flow uh, into this channel to flow through those culverts. So we've already over-designed the system. If you wanted to see the calculations, it's tough to show those calculations when you're looking at, when all calculations are based on an inevitable impact, and the impact of this watershed is so slight, I'm not sure they would do you any good. Um, one additional question. Uh, based on the memorandum we have from the chairman of the Conservation Commission, uh, so far they're not comfortable either with the, their review of the RP2 wetlands permit, which is, as you know, part of the ordinance. And I wonder if you have any commentary about uh, where that stands. Um, it was pretty brief and, uh, from what I saw. And uh, the essence of it was they will take a site long. Uh, and again, we can show flow calculations. That's not a problem. What we did instead of doing that is we over-designed the system. So we can actually go back and show the, uh, the existing calculations of 100-year storm flow through the existing culvert on Pleasant Avenue. It's still not going to really change the size of the culverts because they're already over-designed. If somebody wants to see that, we can certainly provide it. I guess what I'm struggling with is not your, your uh, good faith, uh, outstanding engineering talent in performing the calculations. It's that uh, you know, there are two, two advisory bodies to this board who have both said, gee, we're not satisfied yet, we have some concerns. And uh, I personally, I take you know, the, the input from those, those groups pretty seriously in evaluating a proposal, being the neophyte that I am when it comes to stormwater calculations. So I want to give you folks the benefit of the doubt, but also seriously consider the other inputs we get. Sure. Uh, again, showing a 100-year storm calculation is pretty easy. Uh, and we could have done that. Instead of doing that, we really just said, let's over-design it so it doesn't become an issue. Now it's become an issue. It would have been simple to pop it in the first place. We thought we were just taking care of it by uh, in over-designing the system, but it's easy enough to do that. I know, what, let's put it this way, I know what the end result is going to be. It's, it's going to turn out to be uh, not a problem because of the over-design. And that's not to say we're going to end up shrinking the system. Uh, it is what it is, because we've designed it. We can even expand it if somebody wants to. Uh, all we really want to do is make sure that anybody in the approval process and all the abutters uh, who are anxious about this design at all are appeased by understanding what that system is. So we can certainly take care of it. And what we'll do is we'll just literally put it out a, a paragraph of, uh, of calculations for 100-year stormwater flow uh, through the existing pipe and show how it would actually impact system that we propose that's 100 feet down gradient. Any other concerns with completeness? I have a question for the applicant. One, one of the things that, with regards to your statement regarding grading of the driveway, uh, if the driveway slopes 2% down, at the end of that first 50 feet, you've got three feet of fill. Uh, would you be willing next month to show us the side slope impact of that by a topo plan? Sure. Okay. Is what? And how do you, um, uh, do you, can you tell what the relative contributions to the stormwater are from? 15-inch culvert and the 30-inch culvert? Or do you just assume that they're running full bar each? How do you do that? I mean, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about the pre-development and post-development runoff difference from this area. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're further channelizing uh, the drainage swales to either side of the driveway by these slopes after having three feet of fill in there, uh, I want I may not be able to get a handle of that, but I think the town engineer should be able to see sure. that grading plan. The standard for that is uh, pretty uniform at a 100-year storm event. Mm -hmm. So in essence, what that means is when supposedly every 100 years you get a storm of the caliber that would put X amount of water based on the impervious surface that you have, it's got to go someplace. Uh, so, and those are tabular calculations that are available. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we take that uh, storm water that as in essence of a model and show when it hits an impervious surface, i.e. the driveway, 
how is that impervious surface actually going to act upon the amount of water that now gets theoretically absorbed or sheet flown into the uh, Arctic 2 zone? Where does, where does that water go? What happens to it from the impervious surface? So that's literally the calculation that we just thought anybody would use for maximal effect. Mm -hmm. But isn't, isn't that somewhat different from uh, looking at how much water is running down the gutter of Pleasant Avenue and then coming into this swale beside, our, beside the new driveway? Well, not by much. All we're looking at as far as the, uh, the existing 30 inch the culvert additional is, it, well, that's the additional. What I've just described to you is the additional, which is pretty minimal given 100 linear feet. But the, uh, we can also, again, it's tough to model it, but we can certainly, we have to, we have to assume, that's the only thing we can do, that uh, the existing culvert at its maximum capacity has X amount of water based on the slope and the surface in that area, where does it go? So, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, and we determined that uh, two 24-inch culverts were going to be more than uh, capable of taking care of not only the sheet flow uh, from, or actually the gutter flow from Pleasant Avenue to the existing catch basin into the 15-inch pipe, uh, as well as the upgraded areas, the flow that goes through the 30-inch pipe, okay. and just, again, over-designed it that way. But we can certainly show that capacity. That's, again, tech, that's on the book. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what's your position on completeness? Mr. Chairman, I feel there's a, just a few small things missing in regards to completeness, and uh, I'm sure the applicant would see that they're fulfilled including perhaps another working meeting with town engineer. Uh, and uh, if they aren't fulfilled by the November 20th meeting, we'll just refuse to address it on the agenda. And I think that's enough power in place. <laughs> just the two administrative changes on completeness. Uh, therefore, I would be in favor of voting that this application is complete. So a question, in the past have we uh, approved an application as being complete with the caveat that they come forward with additional items? I mean, essentially we're saying this application isn't quite complete, but if you do these additional items, it will it'll be deemed complete at some point in the future. Whenever you ask me that, I always say that you shouldn't be make something conditionally complete, but I chose not to hear that that's what Mr. Cotter said. I okay.